uh, probably need to be here by one. Yeah, the church may not be done till then, but one o'clock's a good time. Glory to God. Uh, it was just an amazing presence of the Lord tonight as we were worshiping. And I don't know about you, but I kind of just got lost there for a little bit. And I'm still kind of feeling the effects of it. I don't quite want to move out of it. Um, but as we were worshiping, I saw just a little like a handheld mirror. Like, you know, we ladies, right? One side's magnifying, one side's regular. We we try not to look at the magnifying side because we go, oh dear. But <laughs> but what I what I heard the Lord say is that there has been a slight fear of looking into the mirror of the word. And it's a fear that the enemy has tried to put on us. Because the fear is that if we look into the word, we won't measure up. We won't look the way we hope we look. We'll see something that is bothersome and it'll be lodged in our memory. And that's how we will see ourselves rather than the way the Lord sees us. But the Lord said, as you behold my face, I behold your face and your face is beautifully and wonderfully made. You are mine. I have made you in perfection, and I am continuing to perfect everything that concerns you. As you draw near to me, beholding in the glass my glory, you are being changed as you look into it, even as my word says, into the same image of me, from glory to glory, even by my spirit. The Lord says, draw near, fear not. Know me, know my word, reflect my joy, reflect my heart, and reflect my love, and show the world my glory. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We get to be a bride, a glorious bride. I was thinking about that magnifying mirror and that story I've heard on more than one occasion. Where men and women are so different. And I think I shared this recently, but men will walk past the, the big mirror and they'll go, Yeah. Ladies looking at every blemish, everything, fretting over everything they see. And uh, that's why sometimes your husbands look like they could care less how they dress because they think they look fine. Amen. And the lady said, Amen. If I see some, some guy dressed to perfection, I worry about his sexuality. Glory to God. Some people are dapper dressers. I'm not worried about Robert's sexuality, and he's a dapper dresser. Amen? He could be on the cover of GQ. Amen. Well, praise God. That was a ramble, wasn't it? That was an unnecessary <laughs> rabbit trail. Are you ready for the word tonight? I better get into this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll probably get more comments on that than anything else the rest of the night. So, hey, whatever. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And Jesus has just finished teaching on the parable of the sower. What a powerful teaching about assuring you sow into the proper soil, right? In fact, we've been on a teaching for some time now about uh, wise farming versus sloppy farming. And so many charismatic Christians, even faith Christians, uh, want to live by faith, but they're sloppy about their operations. They don't really intentionally take efforts to build their faith, to strengthen their faith, to 
to uh, speak the word consistently. Instead, they're more like throwing stuff out and hoping that it, that it, it uh, manifests. I want to be a wise farmer for God, right? Is that door over there locked? Some of you just tried to get in. Well, she's coming to the other door, so we'll be okay. Uh, I see everything from here. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, but in verse 26, Jesus speaking, it says, And he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. And you sleep and rise night and day. And the seeds that spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. We so far covered nine steps a wise farmer involves himself in, Right? from burning the fields to get rid of the past, to plowing the ground to determine, hey, I can live in an unseen kingdom, to disking the ground, hey, I've got to believe that faith works, to four, uh, you harrow the ground, that you're going to live by this faith. And, you know, we gave different applications to each step. After you harrow, you sow the seed. Then you fertilize, you water, uh, you cultivate. And we're down to step, I believe it's step number 10, which is the final, really, next to the final step. We want to harvest our crop and then house it, right? And if you've done any farming or been around farming, you'll discover that in most cases, harvesting is the most expensive step. It's the most labor-intensive step. Think about what it takes to plant an apple tree. Apple seed. Hole in the ground. But that one seed has the ability to produce thousands and thousands of apples. Amen? And every time you're harvest, harvesting apples, it's, it's, we're talking about manual labor now, not the tree shakers they have today. <laughs> have you seen the tree shakers they have now? They've got these machines on a, on a tractor or you know, some implement. And it goes up and it grabs the tree and just shakes it violently and all the apples fall down into a net that goes around the tree. Well, that's cheating (laughs) when we're talking about spiritual farming. Amen? God may have a tree shaker for us, but right now we've got to know how to to bring in our harvest. And sometimes this is the most difficult step to take. And not only that there's a timing to it. You know, most harvests... There's only a small window of time you can properly bring in at harvest. Wheat, as it matures, the heads of the wheat get so heavy, strong winds can blow it over. If you wait too long, the, the, the wheat will fall out of the head of the, of the, uh, of the wheat. And uh, so there's a time. They measure moisture and know the exact time to bring it in. And hopefully it's not raining, your fields are too wet to get the implements in. Right? And, of course, you've heard of bringing in the sheaves. That's applicable to bringing in a wheat harvest. And uh, you're putting one seed in the ground or maybe just strewing seed out as they used to do. And But you've got to go in and bring in each bundle of wheat as the harvest, much more labor intensive. In fact, look at verse number, let's see where I want to go to. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 27. Am I in the right spot? That is the wrong verse. How could I have possibly wrote that down wrong? There it is. It's verse number. Go to verse number 37. That's a 3, not a 2. Jesus speaking says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. 
Now we understand that this is talking about people to go in to preach the gospel and bring God's harvest of souls into the kingdom. At least that's one of the main applications, right? But it's interesting. A lot of men go out and sow, but they don't know how to house or bring in the harvest. It's one thing to lead somebody in a prayer of salvation. It's another thing to say, okay, now we need to get you to church. We need to get you filled with the Spirit. See, when you get them to church, you're getting housed. You're taking care of the harvest. And, and a lot of evangelisms are just more concerned about leading somebody to Jesus and not the after effects. And a really a, a proper, properly led evangelist follows up on their harvest. They try to do some level of mentoring for that harvest to get them in a place that they're protected from the weather, protected from the storms, protected from the devourers, right? See, in, in, in the wheat fields, when you bring in the harvest, they would bring in these, these uh, truckloads and truckloads of wheat, and they would dump it and elevate it in these huge silos, and fill these silos. And it's interesting, if I remember right, the wheat that comes in is treated for bugs on the spot. No, they're, they're spraying insecticides into the wheat in the silos to keep the insects from devouring or contaminating the wheat even then. And most of those silos, those big units, are then close to railroad tracks that the train cars would come by, and they would fill the train cars and take it to the proper processing stations. And a lot of money. See, it's one thing to have a tractor to plant some weed and even bring in harvest or have a combine. It's another thing to have a whole segment of the industry dedicated just to house and process the harvest. Amen. And it's more than just bringing in souls into the kingdom. It's about them having a home they can go to, a church home, and be built up in the things of the church. You know, I love it that in, in the Word, God talks about five types of offices. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the body of Christ, right? And each office, that personality, that's good, those giftings are different. My gifting is not an evangelist. I have led I don't know how many people to Jesus. I've handed out tracts on the streets. I've done I don't know how many tent meetings. Uh, even Chariots of Light is focused on evangelism. But my heart is once you get them saved, once they're saved, is to raise up them into spiritual maturity. To have them grow from baby state to full spiritual adulthood. And my giftings are different than the evangelist. I I've, I've remember many of the messages I heard years ago. Probably even some in Grace Ministries way back. That the evangelist would come through and he'd talk about how we should be leading so many people to, the, to Jesus every day. Everybody should be leading people to Jesus every day. Well, for some people, that's a lot easier than others. I mean, Billy Jean, Wayne Flo in evangelism. Lynn Flo's in that, in that ability to just speak to people. If I speak to the same people, they'll think I'm weird. <laughs> because my personality doesn't come off the same way. I don't have that, that bubbling charisma that the uh, evangelist does. But yet, you get them to me, I can teach them the word. Do you follow me? That's my assignment. And we each need to know our assignment. But guess what? A lot of times the evangelist thinks they're the harvesters, but those working in the church are the housers. This is the silo system. This is the train tracks and all the industry that goes with it, even the processing station to, to make your bread or whatever you're going to produce out of your harvest. Your cornbread, right? If you're bringing in corn. And... <laughs> Tracks don't cost much, but churches can. Do you follow me? And it's much more of a longer-term investment. And so uh, regarding wise farming for us, we've got to be ready to house what we bring in, to mentor those we're leading to the Lord, right? Now, I believe this also applies to us as wise farmers of the Word. Amen. 
a lot of Christians that say they want to live by faith will think, well, I'll just speak the word. By his stripes I was healed, throw it out there, and never tend to it again. But you got to stay on top of the things of faith. You should have a knowledge of what you've spoken out, what verses you're standing on, and keep the thing watered with praise and continually confessing the word of God. Amen? And then know when it's time to strike with all you have to make the thing manifest. Amen? There's a timing to faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. We actually read this verse a week or so ago. Verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How many want to see what they believe God for coming to manifestation? Then it takes a now faith mentality. See, so many people are believing God for finances or healings or relationships, and it's always off in the future. Someday my family will turn around. Someday I'll have my healing. Someday I'll have my money come in or whatever it is. Someday I'll be debt free. But you're not targeting it intentionally. Do you follow me? You're not placing a demand on the now word. And now means present tense. And there comes a time when you've got to know 41 has come. Remember the 41 will come? You've got to know it's time. And say, it's my now time for this to happen. I understand that there's seed time in the harvest. But so often the enemy has us extend our time indefinitely. There's seed and there's indefinite waiting. And you don't have now faith. You have someday faith. And there's a place where you build enough word in you and you keep staying on top of what you're believing God for that you know I have it now. Amen. It's mine today. And you get determined about it. You get vigilant about it. I command my harvest to come in now. And you'll act on it. Now, in the past, I've taught in here five steps to living by faith or manifesting anything by faith. You guys remember the five steps? I know I've taught so many steps on everything. You're like, which, which set is this? Let me give you a hint. Step one is revelation. Shall I tell you all five steps real quick so it's not like a, a quiz? Revelation, meditation, application, manifestation, and restoration. Anything you're believing God for that you're going to receive by faith, first you have, a, have to have a revelation. You can have it. That the Word gives you that promise. You've got to see that God said in the Word you can be healed or you can be blessed financially. Your children can be blessed. Your marriage can be restored. You've got to see it in the Word. Yeah. Amen. You have a revelation. But you don't have faith in it yet. How does faith come? By hearing and hearing by the Word. Repeated exposure to. We can put in it. Faith comes by repeated exposure to the Word of God. That you keep it in front of you. And the example we've used in the past, I hear it used often, is as a cow chewing its cud. Right? To meditate means to chew on, to mull over, to keep moving it through your mind. When, when a cow eats grass, and again, if you've been on a farm, you'll know this. But the cow eats the grass, and being raised on a dairy farm much of my life, uh, the cows would eat all the nice grass out in the field, but then we'd bring them forth to the, into the corral to be milked. And you look out there, and all of a sudden the cow's chewing. There's no grass in the corral. There's nothing, nothing edible in that corral, believe me. Amen? Just layer upon layer of fertilizer. But the cow's chewing. And the cow has a, a stomach with different compartments. I've heard three stomachs, a three-compartment stomach, two stomachs, four stomachs. I have not dissected one to find out. Amen? 
but they have a stomach with different compartments. And when they chew the grass the first time, they eat it, they chew it, they swallow it, and it goes down to one stomach, and the bacteria and the enzymes start working on grass to start breaking it down. And it'll work so far, and then later the cow will call that cud, that ball of grass, pre-chewed grass, back up and start chewing on it again. And swallow it again. And it'll be worked on by the enzymes and the bacteria some more because grass is very hard to digest. And so they'll keep pulling it up and chewing on it more and more until it's finally broken down enough they can swallow it to the final compartment of their stomach and go into the rest of the digestatory, digestive tract. Right? And this is what I love. What used to be grass is miraculously transformed to ribeye. That's a miracle of God. That cow used to be grass, but something in tie inside of the, of the cow transformed it to something we can eat. We can't eat grass. I mean, I guess we could if we cooked it long enough or whatever. I don't know what the ramifications are, but people don't eat grass. Amen. We eat cow. And a cow does a miracle where he turns grass into something we can eat. Right? Well, in the same way when we meditate the word, we meditate that word, we're taking a word that was logos, really unusable to us as far as any supernatural content. But as we digest it by meditating it over and over again, it infuses to our soul, it becomes life to us, and we can partake of the power in that word. Amen. Meditation transforms logos to rhema, really transforms it to faith on the inside. And when you get faith and when you meditate it on it long enough, you know you have it. And again, sloppy farmers, one of the major mistakes they make is they don't want to take the time to meditate the word. Let me give you a truth. Revelation is fun and exciting. Meditation is work. The Bible says to work the word. Well, you put it to work for you, but you also have to work it through meditation. You've got to be willing to put in the time. I know it would be more fun to watch a Western on TV or, <laughs> you know, let's make a deal or whatever. But that won't produce any eternal life for you. And it's important you get these promise cards we have back there, these, these, these scripture cards or whatever you need, write down the verses you want to you develop faith in. And carry it with you and just read it to yourself. And I'm, the method I used regarding healing, I would say by his stripes I was healed. By his stripes. He took a beating on the, on, on the whipping post for me. And I, me, myself, I, yours truly. What are all the words we used to use for us, you know? This guy right here is healed actually was healed 2,000 years ago. And you'll think about it. I was healed. Me, my, I was healed. By the stripes, me, I was healed. And you let it just sit there and you think about it and you meditate it. What's that mean? That means no sickness should be able to stick to me. No disease should be able to come into my life. And you ponder it and you confess it and you think about it some more. What's that mean? That means I'm, I am Teflon to disease. Right? And you spend time meditating and until all of a sudden, well, it's not all of a sudden, until through this process of chewing your spiritual cud, what used to be logos becomes faith. And now all of a sudden, you can receive what you believe for. And, and, and you need to make sure your faith is now faith. Now faith is present tense. That it's working now and you're receiving now. Remember the verse we read in Mark 4? First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. There's a time involved and there's a process of development, developing your manifestation. But you keep working the word the whole time. You keep your faith now. Because if you don't water your faith, you don't keep meditating it, you don't keep speaking it, it will dry up. And you'll have yesterday's faith. 
I would venture to say there's stuff each of us have believed for in the past. If you've been in this very long, you believe for the past, you forgot you were believing for it. It wasn't kept now. And there's a good chance you won't receive it. Amen. What farmer forgets what fields he has? Or what's he's got in, what he's got in the fields, right? I think I got a field out there somewhere. He'll tell you how many acres, what it is. Do you follow me? The last time he, you know, sprayed insecticide or, or, or cultivated or whatever, he knows the dates. He knows his planned date of harvest. He knows when he needs the rains to come in. He's working his harvest. And we've got to be wise farmers. Living by faith is intentional. It's not accidental. You don't do it lackadaisical, apathetic, in an apathetic fashion. You intentionally farm your crops. Amen. So we want revelation, meditation. Next step is application, right? And application has its own three steps. Do you remember the three steps to application? Speak, act, and stand. You want to see your harvest come forth? You first have to speak it into manifestation. I believe I receive. Everybody say that. I believe I receive. Was that hard? Wasn't hard, but a lot of people have been convinced that's all you do. I just believe I receive. Well, that's like sowing some seeds out there, don't even know where they landed, and forgetting about them. There's more to it than that. If this thing was one, two, three easy, everybody would be doing it. Everybody would be healed and wealthy and full of joy and peace and without problems because that's what faith will do for you. But the only ones that will manifest are those that really put an effort into farming it. You've got to be intentional about it. So you speak intentionally. Part B of application or activation is you act. Again, James said, faith without works is dead being alone. Amen. The example we often use is if, if you're believing God to be healed from the flu, then get up and do what you can do. You know, you get up in the morning and, or you want to get up and all of a sudden you feel like, oh, I feel nauseous, dizzy, got a headache, whatever. I must have the flu. Honey, bring me some chicken soup and call work. I'm not coming in. Well, you're going to stay sick. You're not acting. And by the way, by his stripes, I was healed. <laughs> I'm going to say something. Nobody get upset. Please, nobody get upset. But I, if I was fighting symptoms, I don't care what kind. Unless they were extremely contagious, unless it was COVID or something similar, I'd get to church. Because there's the anointing. If nothing else, call for the elders. Well, I don't want to call anybody. I'd just rather stay sick. They don't say that, but that's what they might as well be saying. Because the Bible says, is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church who will anoint him with oil. Amen. Pray for him. And he shall be healed. Shall be. There's a spiritual principle and a promise that few activate. But there's an action. Call for the elders. Get to church. Get out of bed if you can. Amen. Try to take a shower. Don't, do not speak the sickness. Do not personalize it. Do not say, I am sick. You can say, I'm fighting some symptoms. Or sickness is trying to hit me. But don't, don't personalize it. Then you own it. When you say, I am or I have the flu. You just claimed it as your own. And death and life is what we speak. So you act. You get out of bed. You go take a shower, whatever. Try to get there. And hey, if you can't make it, 
you need to go back to get bed, go back to bed. But as you can, work it the best you're able. I mean, I've told these testimonies before. But several years back, this would have been probably 2004 or something like that. Uh, that was before that. We were in the other church building. I was over there myself, and I was trying to move on those big, big screen TVs. Remember the projection TVs? I was trying to move it, and I had to get in an uncomfortable position, twisted, and I blew out my back. I've never had my back blow out like that before. It felt like two or three discs just exploded. I had to crawl to my car. Somehow got home. Went in the house, told Patty. She said, well, you shouldn't have tried to pick up the TV. <laughs> Miss Mercy for everybody but me. <laughs> and I was hurting. And the devil saying, get to the emergency room now. You need surgery immediately. They're going to fuse your back, put rods in it, all these other things. Better get there now. And nothing wrong with that if somebody does. But I'm going, no bias drops. I was healed. I crawled to the couch, sat on the couch, and I'm sure I had Patty bring it, but I had a, a cassette player and had a 12 tape set of Pastor Callan's tapes on divine healing. I sat on the couch and I put in a tape. And I played and I listened to healing, healing teachings. Thank you, Jesus. For an hour, the whole time my back screaming. Devil screaming, you're, you're going to be paralyzed if you don't get to the emergency room now. Call an ambulance. You can't, even, you can't even ride there. You need a backboard, all these things. I put the healing tape on and play it. Use an hour, an hour and a half tape. And it was done. I said, okay, God, I'm going to put, I'm going to put action to my faith. I'd stand up, take everything I had to stand up. If you ever had a back problem, you know what I'm talking about. And I said, by his stripes, I was healed. And I stomped around the room. Big circle around the room. Every step, my back was screaming. Would collapse again, put on another tape. I did that for three days. Never left that couch except to go to the, crawl to the restroom or struggle to it. After three days, I put in another tape. You remember all this? Patty's going to maybe you ought to get to the hospital. You know, I'm, no, I'm healed. Not putting rods in my back. I put another tape in. It played. Finished. I stood up and God says, now I want you to jump. Jump? Anybody else up there? I said, okay, God, but I'm not doing, I'm not, I'm not doing this halfway. I'm jumping everything I got and I'm coming down flat footed. Instead of springing up and doing this, I'm going. So I jumped as high as I could and went boom like that. And what I did, had a brand new back. Amen. Total brand new back, could lift anything. If you guys have been around me, I can lift anything now. Refrigerators, I don't care. Ice cream machines, we'll lift. Uh, because God gave me a new back. But it took action to do that. And that action is part of what's required to bring in a harvest. That jump was the last step, the hardest, most expensive step to bring in that harvest. But boom, there it was. And so many people won't act on it. They won't take the harvest steps necessary to bring it in. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the migraine healing, healing but I had migraines for years. And uh, I took a stand. Beat my head on the dash of the of the van till they were gone. Amen. Acting ridiculous based on the word. But I got my harvest. No more migraines. Thank you, Jesus. I used to have to run the whole family out of the house. Turn off all the lights, have just as much silence as I could get. Take a few oxycodons, which didn't even touch them, or whatever pills I could get a hold of. Whatever they give me, whatever I wanted, and uh, pillows over my head and face, heating pads, and try to fall asleep, try to pass out, because usually the next day it was gone, or that day was shot. This was happening about every two weeks to a month. I was getting these things, and I and I'd fought them before. I'd fought them before, so I'm healed. But then I'd collapse, give up, 
But that final time I said, I'm not putting it when I start slamming my head on the dash of the van. Again, most of you heard the details before. That action, that harvest action, manifested my healing. Amen. So what you're believing God for, it may requ be required you do something dramatic. Sometimes financially, God will have you sow something. It'll bring tears to your eyes. I think I have a, I think I have a verse here. Let me see if I have this one or not. Go to Psalm 126. Don't let me forget my five steps that were in that. Psalm 126. It's the wrong direction. This is not it. I need my iPad to find it, I guess. Oh, here it is. Yeah, yeah. Verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bearing as she's with him. Why would you cry weeping? I mean, sowing should be an exciting time. I've got my harvest going out. But apparently, there's sometimes what God has you sow has you in tears. God says, sow that motorcycle. No. <laughs> if I don't want to. How about those cars? Sow those cars. I can sell those cars. I pay off some of those debts. Sow the car. And every time, here would be a harvest come in. It's amazing. How that end time, that end of crop seed many times will jolt your harvest coming in. Amen. And, uh, of course, I've told this story. I think I told it last night to some of the people. When Lori was in school, this has been about 10 years ago. We were in debt up to our eyeballs. The school debt and everything else. And uh, her school book came due. We didn't have the money. Couldn't put it on a card. Our cars were filled. Uh, just a mess. And I don't know how I was going to pay it. But I'd taken, somebody had given me a 1988 IROC Camaro out of a field. Been in a field two years. And they said, you want this car? I said, yeah, I'll fix it up. Boy, that was something. When I started tearing it down, it had been the Mouse Hotel for two years. And every time I pulled any, it had all these ground effects. It was one of these really low to the ground. It had all these effects around it. I, and I pulled every one off. It was rusted out every, under every one. I took two years and totally rebuilt the car. New interior, carpet, dash. Uh, redid all the rust. Took all the rust out. Repainted it. It was sharp. And I had that car. And... So Lori's bill's got to pay. And I said, well, Patty, I finish that car. I'll sell the car. I figured I'd get somewhere between fifty five hundred and six thousand dollars for it. And so we parked it out here with a for sale sign. I don't know how many people came in here and said, I want to buy the car. I want that car. As soon as I get paid, I'll buy the car. And nobody ever brought any money. And it came to the place. She was, Lori was getting notes from the school. If your bill's not paid in two weeks, we're shutting you out of classes. And she was a great student. And so I'm thinking, well, I got to sell this car. I'll drop the price, whatever. And we're in a church service at the Grace Advance, February of that year. And a special speaker was there. And while he's speaking about seed time and harvest, God said, I want you to sow that Camaro. And he told me who to give it to. God, <laughs> Lori's going to be thrown out of school. I have no other way to pay this bill except sell that car. He said, sow the car. I leaned to Patty during service and Patty told me to, Patty, uh, God just told me to sew that car. She said, you're going to sell that car and pay Lori's school bill. I said, I know, but he told me to sew it to this person. And when I told her, she said, I believe that's God. That'd be the Holy Ghost. And uh, so that next weekend, that was a Tuesday night that happened. That Saturday night, I called the parents of the boy and says, I believe the Lord's told me to sew your son 
so, so to this your son this 88 hot rod. I said, I don't want to get your permission because he's only 17, and this thing will fly. I mean, that thing would move. And uh, he said, well, praise God. Yeah, we think it would be great. He's very responsible. He helped us here at the coffee shop for some time by, for volunteer. Just help us. And uh, we, we brought him and him and his family on a Sunday morning. I gave him the keys of the car. He was just elated. The next night, no, the night before, somebody came to me in the office and said, last Tuesday night, God told me to sow you a seed. Same service we were in. He was in the same service. He said, God told me to give you $10,000. See, God knew that all along. He could have thrown that in. Yeah. Yeah. Said, you sow this, you know, give somebody the car and you'll get 10000 You know, that would have helped. But instead, I got to sweat for another several days. And then also, he dropped 5000 in the church offering the next day, which was a big benefit for us, especially at that time. And it was like miracle breakthrough because we obeyed God in that harvest step to sow the car. But you know what I talk about wanting to cry? Here's a car I just spent two years, not a total restoration, but about the next thing to it, going through all kinds of stuff on that car, the engine, everything, and uh, it was nice. Bye-bye car. <laughs> but breakthroughs. And so your harvest is an important time. In fact, it's so vital to be able to hear what God is saying. Keep your faith now and be tuned to hear what God's telling you to do to bring in. Because what will happen is you keep your faith now and as harvest time draws, your spirit man knows it. It's time. And you'll have an anxiousness inside. It's time. You'll know it's time. And you'll be listening. Okay, God, anything else I need to do to manifest this? Could be to sow a seed. Could be to fast. Could be to double up on your word. Amen. Listen to more messages, whatever it might be. But God wants you to bring in the harvest more than you want it. But there's an acting involved. Part three, part C of our, remember, revelation, meditation, application, or activation. Three parts, speak, act, and stand. Having, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Talking about the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. You there? Going to go to verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. It's amazing with so many things you're believing God for. It so often doesn't come on your schedule. We'll put schedules on God. God, I need this by this time. It doesn't happen. Well, God, I thought I had that. Well, you did. Until you start running your mouth. It just wasn't on your schedule. There's so many times God wants to demonstrate that he's a miracle-working God. He wants to bring it suddenly. And so many times he wants to bring it at the last minute. Amen. I don't know why he does that. I mean, it, it could be just to strengthen our faith. Knowing he's going to come through. But me, I like God to come in early. Do you follow me? I like the bills paid way ahead of time. You know, I, I like manifestations before I even need them. And we're seeing a lot of that. But so many times when you're learning faith especially, you see last minute manifestations. In fact, sometimes you see what you thought were late manifestations. 
but they're not late. And Habakkuk 2, talking about the vision of the glory, he says, everyone that sees the vision or reads the vision should run toward it. He says, for the vision is for an appointed time. In fact, look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Put it in front of your eyes. Back at chapter 2, if you got it, wait for me. My mind went squirrel all of a sudden. All right, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. What's appointed mean or appointed time mean? Predetermined set time. God knows the time of everything you're believing Him for. There's an appointed time. And it says, but if the end you shall speak. Now we know the vision of the glory coming to the earth, verse 14, is for the end times. But He says, and lie not, in other words, it's going to happen, though it tarry, wait for it. Having not all to stand, stand ye therefore, because it will surely come. It will not tarry or be late, but it's going to seem like it. And a wise farmer does not uproot his crop because it did not come on his schedule. Because here's how you uproot your crop. When it doesn't hit at your timetable, well, I thought I had. I guess it didn't work. You just uprooted your crop. Well, I thought faith was going to bring me these answers, these, or these solutions. I guess I didn't have enough faith. You just uprooted your crop. Faith always works. Amen? But it's, it's, it's directed. What's the word I want? Throttled or released based on what you say. Well, I thought God said I was healed, but I guess I'm not. I still feel terrible. If you keep speaking your symptoms, you're going to be standing for a long time. Speak your solution. Speak you were healed. And I'm telling you, I don't see it much in here anymore because we learned that there was a time People come up in the prayer line and be cursing their seed left and right. Well, I sowed a seed, but I guess it, you know, I must have missed God. It's not the devil telling you to sow. In most cases, he, he, he can take advantage of some people's naivety and take things too far. But in most cases, it's not the devil telling you to sow your precious seed. Amen. He doesn't want you to have seed in the ground. He doesn't want you being a blessing, right? But people will say, well, I guess it didn't work. You just sprayed Roundup on your crop. You just cursed your own crop. And having done all to stand means not just waiting, but continuing to speak the proper words. Continue to praise God for the harvest, for the manifestation, right? You keep standing doing what you've done in the past, and even more so if God directs. We're so much of a microwave generation, we want everything right now. Just let me take a pill. Let me push a button. Let me go to the ATM. You follow me? For my solution, I don't want to trust or wait on God, yet God's system never fails. Eventually, your ATM card is going to run out of opportunity. But God's system always produces. And so a wise farmer speaks, he acts, and he stands until he has his answer. Amen? Step number four is manifestation. Once you stood, you spoke and you acted, you stood, or, or you stood, then comes your faith manifestation. Praise God, that's the part where you're rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. But God has more than you just 
bringing in one harvest by your faith. We're to live by faith. And to live by faith means we're using our faith in every area of our life, which will produce step five, which is restoration. That's God's plan for every believer. Revelation, meditation, application, manifestation, and restoration. It's not different for a single person on earth, but to use your faith to receive from God. Amen? Let's go another passage. Luke chapter 12. And I believe this is very important as well. Luke 12. And I'm going to start at verse number 16. Well, let's read verse 15. But this whole passage in my Bible is labeled a prosperous farmer. Anybody else have labeling similar to that in your Bible? Verse 15 says, And he, Jesus, said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. You got to make sure anything you possess doesn't possess you. Everything you possess, in the, wise, in the life of an end time wise revivalist, everything you possess can be remarked seed. Oh, nobody wants to hear that. It's amazing. A lot of my best stuff, God's re. re allocated his faith or his seed. He says, verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. This is a rich man. I understand this is a parable. It's an example, right? So we're really not talking about farming per se. This is a man farming in the kingdom of heaven. Remember Jesus' teachings repeatedly in his doctrine, he taught about seed time and harvest. He taught about farming. So it's not just about raising corn or wheat or cows or whatever. This is talking about a man that's used his faith. He's functioned in the kingdom of heaven to bring in his harvest. And he's gotten wealthy out of it. You remember in the parable of the sowers? <laughs> parable of the sower, some seed fell among thorns. And when the thorns sprung up, they choked out the word. And those thorns represented the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things. It's amazing. Once you start gaining substance in your life, how to try to choke out the word out of your life. And you got to be willing, anything you possess is still in God's hands to do with what he wants to. Amen. And that blessed everybody that heard it. <laughs> so the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my, my fruits. And he said, this will I do. Do you notice how much he's talking to himself? I'm not the only one. <laughs> this will I do. I will build, pull down my barns. And build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Say all my fruits. How much is all of them? Everything. He considered it as all his to do with what he wanted to. And I will say to my soul. It's good to talk to your soul if you say the right things. I will say to my soul. Soul. That was much goods. Laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, quit farming. Retire. Live off what you have. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Your harvest isn't just about you. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians, he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Multiplies our seed sowed. 
you got to know when you're bringing a harvest. Is this more seed is, or is this for me? Or is a percentage of it for God? Now, it should be a no-brainer that the 10% increase is tithe. I'm about to say something. Hopefully, nobody's threatened by it. But your tithe is not seed. God says the tithe belongs to me. It's holy unto me. It already belongs to God. Your tenth, that tenth belongs to God. And I can't sow what somebody owns. Your seed is what you send forth above the tenth. And I've had people get mad at me because of this teaching. Well, I tithe. Well, where's your seed? Do you follow me? Don't tell me you, you have seed in the ground if all you're doing is tithing. Amen. And not that I'm trying to, you know, correct anybody, but if somebody says, hey, this is what I do, where's my harvest? That's not seed. Amen. So this farmer brought in plentifully through working in the kingdom of heaven, got wealthy out of it and said, okay, now I'm going to retire on what I have and never mind the kingdom of heaven anymore. Never mind that I'm really all this time working for the kingdom. See, God has a plan for the finances. And God wants you wealthy. He wants you blessed. The, 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 word, the word that this man made the mistake was, he says, I will bestow all. He could have said, he could have said, I'm going to bestow all these goods to a barn and then find out what I'm to do with it. Or even say, I'm going to live well, but I'm going to also hear God on what I'm to sow. Your barn has to be dumpable into the kingdom of heaven to be a harvester. Is this too hard tonight? I don't know how many times Patty and I in the past have emptied our checking account. I say, sow a seed, we'll dump the whole thing. You tell us, sow it all. Of course, it wasn't a whole lot. But we went to nothing. And now we have more. And I don't know that God will say to do it again. It's his right to do so. But I do believe there's a place you get faithful with sowing. You see, when God tells you to sow it, that he won't tell you to do that anymore. I remember one time hearing Jesse the Planets preaching. And he needed a wall put around his facility in New Orleans. I saw his house when I was there back in October. Didn't go in it, but we just drove by it. And uh, he needed, no, it was around his, not his house, but around his uh, ministry facility. And it was something like, I don't know, $50,000 or something, maybe more. And he's in a meeting, and they're taking the offering, and God says, I want you to put $17,000 in this offering. And he says, God, that's all I have. And God said, that's all I asked for. <laughs> that would have been a long time ago. But uh, God, we got to have the attitude. He determines what seed. We can determine a measure we sow, but we got to be open. If we're going to go into all that God has, he's got access to all that we have. And he's not mocked, whatever we sow, we shall reap. But this man built silos not for the kingdom, but for himself. He improperly housed his harvest, and it cost him his entire future. Amen. Hopefully not his soul. God is raising up a generation of professional harvesters. Look at Proverbs 13. 
We'll close with this verse. Well, we'll read the verse. We're not going to close right away because I've got to preach on it. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. That is a spiritual prophetic declaration. God said, the wealth of the world is laid up for my people. Now, why does God want us to have the money? It's because of the golden rule. He that has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> That's a variation of the golden rule. Because wicked have been using money to control the world for wickedness. And God said, I'm going to turn this around. There'll be an inversion of wealth of the wicked. And I'm going to give it over to the hands of the righteous to use it for the benefit of the kingdom of God. And I truly believe God has a plan for the end times. He's going to bankrupt the devil. But he can't do it through penny any seed. He's raising up professional farmers in the end times. Amen. I heard somebody say that God told them, and I believe it, that not only is the end time church going to manifest the hundredfold return of every seed they've sown themselves, but they're going to manifest the hundredfold return of every seed ever sown by the church over the ages that they didn't see the harvest on. Because God's not mocked. Every seed has to produce. And guess what? I believe we're the 11th hour harvesters to bring in that financial blessing. What are you going to do with it? I have no desires in life for anything financial. You follow me? Hey, keep tires on my motorcycle, gas in the tank, I'm good. Get Patty, you know, a new pair of shoes every day or two. That'd be fun. I don't have any materialistic desires whatsoever. Well, I kind of like pinball machines, but but uh, if I had if I had a billion dollars given to me, I have no desire for it, other than to bless the kingdom of heaven. What can I do to bless the kingdom? And God's looking for people with that attitude. Now, God may say, take that billion and buy a company. Use for righteousness purposes. Are you following me? We just got to hear God on how to control the harvest, what to do with it, right? Did you get anything out of this? Father, we thank you for the ability, the right to function in your kingdom. Speak to us clearly how to farm with accuracy and wisdom. Show us what we're to sow, what we're to keep, what we're to even possess. But so is, show us how to bring in our harvest. Sow the right seed, bring in the harvest, and have now faith. If anybody, if anybody gets anything tonight, let them know the need to keep their faith now. And you'll make everything else work. I speak in this church, there are none sick. None. None with injuries, none with physical abnormalities or afflictions in Jesus' name, no pain. I break their assignments in Jesus' name. Everyone in this church is healed by the power of the anointing. COVID-19 cannot touch a member of this church, much less any other problems. Diabetes is cursed from this church. We refuse it, ability to operate. No kidney stones in this church. No cancer in this church. We rebuke it by the power of the word and the power of the blood. There's no strife, no animosity, no oppression, no lack in any fashion. This is a church that you have blessed and we refuse for the thorns to come up and choke out any aspect of our spiritual pursuits. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, no one.